Kudos, uh, willkommen in einem and in an Fregens video. Welcome to another exciting video, in this case episode 60 of my game system design series. In this video, I'll be investigating scenarios and victory conditions specifically for World War II or Cold War figure gaming rules. But these could also be applicable for Napoleonics with some modification. When a rules designer first creates a set of rules, they often focus on just the rules and tend to ignore supporting material, such as scenarios. Rules which have become successful will often gain a large number of players who are happy to create scenarios, but in order to be successful you do need some scenarios. This also applies to points-based competition games, although is a lesser issue and those type of scenarios tend to be much simpler to create. The first objective we need to identify is what type of scenario which you wish to create. If you're recreating history, you can often have an easier time, as you know what happens and when it happens. The issue is finding a suitable scenario, as many sets of figure gaming rules often use a scale which does not lend itself to recreating a historical engagement, or at least one that's much fun to play. As at those scales, the historical engagements which player would be familiar with are generally few and far between. A skirmish or squad set of rules would have this issue, so at that scale you're better off creating generic scenarios. At platoon scale, that is one platoon equals an element, where each player commands a brigade or regiment size formation, the number of possible engagements do grow. However, few tend to be evenly based and it's difficult to find a good scenario, although I must admit not impossible. One example of a good scenario occurred during the earliest stages of the Battle of Hanot, with a German Panzer Battalion attacking a French infantry company and then being counterattacked by a company of S-35 medium tanks. This raged for several hours and a, and a set of rules such as Spearhead or Corps Commander could easily simulate this historical and interesting engagement. At this scale, you do have a wide range of historical conflicts to model. If you wish to be creative, you could even dramatically change these. However, when you drill down, many engagements at this scale are asymmetrical. As an example is the Russian attack at the German 6th Panzer Division at Rasinin. In this, we see a Russian tank battalion attack a German anti-tank battery supported by an infantry battalion. Unfortunately, after the KV-1s ran over the German anti-tank guns, the infantry ran away as fast as they could. This probably took no longer than an hour and would probably be a bit boring to recreate in a figure gaming format. If we move to a company scale, each side would command a division, which has benefits and disadvantages. At this scale, conflicts are more known. So at Hanat, 1940, during the German invasion of Belgium, you could have the German Panzer Division attack half of the French mechanised division. It would be an interesting scenario. However, when you look at engagements at this scale, most are one side is a defender and the other is an attacker. Nonetheless, the historical scenarios which would be su suitable are reasonable, as long as you accept the fact that one side will always be defending and the other side will always be attacking. Finally, at battalion scale, or when one element is a battalion, we have both sides commanding a core size formation. At this scale, especially if the games can range over several game days, we have even more engagements we can consider. However, this is an unusual scale and there are very few rules which provide this, Kiss Rommel and board game conversions such as Neuschwerpunk being an exception. Historical battles are very specific, and I'm not going to cover how to design such a game and what victory conditions are required, as the designer knows what each side does during this campaign. Thus, all they need to do is ensure the force mix and special rules that reflect this, and then create victory conditions based on this flow. The main focus in this video are generic points-based games, which give you an interesting game. Two equal sides meeting each other does not give you a good game at any scale, so I'll, oh well, apart from skirmish, so I'm going to bypass that style of game. Instead, I'm first determining what I expect to occur on the playing area and build a scenario based on that. If playing across the long axis of a playing area, in this case a 3 by 4 foot playing area, what type of movement do we expect in a typical game? Ideally, a typical game should have the attacker, on average, take most of the playing area or possibly 75% of the playing area in a game. If the attacker can advance further, then the attacker has a better chance of being the victor. If the attacker does not advance that far, the attacker has a reduced chance of being a, a victor. 
You could end the game here. However, for more interest, a counterattack could be considered in the second half of the game. For now, I will only focus on the first half of the game. Let's now look at victory conditions. There are many solutions, but I've found having an objective-based system is probably the best. It forces players to do something while not worrying too much about losses affecting victory. You could certainly have a system where excessive losses results in a higher formation becoming impaired, but this would be ideally in the rules, not in the victory conditions. If this is lacking, then you can add some form of, let's say, one loss hit uh, equals a certain number of victory points, uh, or if you have so many losses, you've lost. But that's something you can consider as a special victory condition example. The simplest system would to ha only have one objective, which is required to be taken by the attacker to achieve a draw, and a failure results in a loss. The issue with one objective is that there are only two states, and we want a win, draw, and a loss at a minimum, so we need probably other objectives. It also lends itself to gamey type tactics, which is not a good thing. We can add an objective on the defender's player's edge. If the attacker takes this, the attacker has won. This gives us our three states. The issue with this simplistic system is the three states can be determined in a very simple manner, which you can quickly determine well before you get to that point. As a result, the game will probably end much quicker than otherwise. This could be a positive thing, but um, you should really design it in a way that this doesn't become the norm. We can take our two objectives and measure them twice, giving us more outcomes. If we use victory points, we could give the attacker one VP if they take any of these objectives at any point in the game, and one VP if they hold it at the end of the game. This way, even if the attacker has taken both objectives, the defender can try and retake one before the end of the game for a draw, or even both. If we want another level of victory or loss, we could even expand these objectives. In this example, we can have a total of four VPs, thus we can have five states and obtain a rather nuanced victory or loss condition. A decisive win or loss would require exceptional gameplay. There are many reasons why you'd want to do this. The most important is it allows you to modify the delta between states, that is, you know, draw, victory, etc. So, for example, going from a draw to a marginal win occurs after a single event. If that event is influenced by luck, you may not wish this and probably would like a more broader range for this single state change. Thus, moving from a draw to win requires, let's say, two events. With five states, we can make a draw range from one to three VPs, which is a rather large range, so we may need to confer more states. If we had add an objective in the centre of the playing area, we can increase the number of VPs to six Remember, you get one for taking at any time and one for holding at the end of the game. Thus, you can have six VPs, which allows us seven states. Zero VP is a state. This works. However, there are mechanics issues. Having an objective on the player edge which could be taken may cause issues such as if there are no reinforcements, the attacker can consider the player edge a safe flank which may not be such a wonderful idea. A better system would be to move everything over towards the attacker's side. In the example, we do not have any objectives on the player edge. In this case, the attacker could be expected in a normal game to be able to take the centre objective, thus a draw. But there is a possibility the defender can stop the attacker securing the objective closest to the attacker's edge, which would be exceptional, and thus the attacker would achieve a pretty bad loss. And alternatively, it's possible for the attacker to take the objective closest to the defender's edge, and thus the attacker would achieve a massive victory. In this example, a draw represents the attacker taking two objectives and holding one. This means the average attacker advance will only be to the midpoint of the playing area. This represents the simplest victory condition system which provides up to seven states and avoids the fighting on a player edge issue. This also allows us to bundle states together, so more than one event is required to move from one state to another. If we feel the game system is unduly affected by luck or we are uncertain if our scenario is balanced, we can bundle margin results or marginal results into a draw, thus reduce the number of victory states, so to speak. If a scenario is well balanced, this would probably not be required, but by having seven states, we have the option of dealing with possibly unbalanced scenarios. You know, for example, the midpoint or the average result will always be a marginal attacker's victory. 
Thus, if we bundle the marginals all together in a draw, then we achieve our balanced effect. Side note, the reason why I went for seven states is probably purely historical. I played a lot of competition games and seven states were used to deal with unbalanced scenarios. Each game allocated six points. A decisive win gave us six points to one player and zero to the other. A draw gave three to each and so on. It worked very well and the out and and overcame unbalanced scenario issues over a competition length. Thus, it's not really required for an individual game. You could just simply have simple three states, win, loss and draw. Let's look at some other possible objective or examples. In this example, we have a special objective on the defender's edge, which, if taken at any time in the game, ends with an attacker's victory. It provides for a quick way to end the game if the attacker is very successful. We could also have one on the attacker's edge, although in this type of scenario, it's probably unnecessary because there's no counterattack. Let's now swing over to the second half of the game, a possible counterattack. This is not necessary, and a simple attack-defence game can provide a very interesting game. But if you want both players the option of attacking and defending, a counterattack in the second half of the game is a good idea for any scenario. We first need to determine how extensive the attack counterattack should be. If the game is a length of 12 game turns, then a counterattack uh, back to the centre of the playing area would require... A th at least a third of the available game turns. So the breakdown would be nine game turns versus three game turns. That's nine game turns when the attacker is attacking and three game turns for the counter-attack. If the game has a length of 12 game turns, which is optimal, then a counter-attack back to the objective closest to the attacker's edge, if that was your objective, then it would need to be a 6-6, six, six, that is six game turns attacking, attacker attacking, and six game turns, counter-attack game turn situation. Players can determine what kind of balance they wish to achieve, but for this exercise I'll use this option as both players get an equal time attacking and defending. Can our three objective system work in this particular case? Calculating this kind of uh, situation is more difficult as the maximum position of the attacker's advance is not really known. If we assume a draw remains at three VPs, we need to have a more aggressive attacker advance. It may be reasonable for the attacker to take three objectives, resulting in the counterattack needing to take them all back. The force mixes will need to be adjusted, but this gives us a maximum playing area utilisation, although I must admit, not a particularly reasonable or optimal one. A more reasonable scenario is if the attacker can only take two objectives, it must be able to hold one to, let's say, get a draw. If it only takes one, then it obviously has no chance of victory. This gives the attacker a powerful incentive to take all three objectives if they want a big win, even if the cost in losses is very high. If the attacker wants to win big time, then he must or she must take three objectives, which means this should be the default result, with a counterattack retaking all objectives possibly also being a default. If it only takes two objectives, it, the attacker can still win by retaining all those objectives. You'd probably want an auto-win objective on the attacker's player edge in this particular case. This is one possible option. One option is that you could possibly create a midpoint victory condition if players want a quicker game, giving players the option long quick. This would normally increase the VPs required for a specific result to be raised by at least one. Thus, in a full game, um, an attacker may need four VPs to achieve a draw, but in a half game, the attacker would need five VPs to achieve a draw. The issue with this is we need extra states in order to give our seven results for each of the two options, full game or half game. From experience, while I like these counterattack games, in most cases I end the game with the counterattack or when the counterattack is about to start. It's often painfully obvious who's going to win at this point. But if that's not the case, then playing to the end can be a satisfying option if players so desire. A counterattack in the last third of the game tends to be more useful. It also allows you to reduce the number of game turns to nine, six game turns for the attacker attack, and three game turns for counterattack. The options are many, but in summary, the rules are as follows. You need at least three objectives, measure VPs for each objective twice, that is when the attacker takes it, and then if the attacker still controls it at the end of the game. 
Now we come to the hard bit, force mixers. This depends a great deal on the rules, but there are some general guidelines to consider. In all cases, you need a reasonably accurate points system. Otherwise, it becomes very hard to create your scenario without a lot of play testing. If you lack this for a set of rules, you may need to create your own. The uh, three to one rule, that is the attacker has a three times advantage over the defender, generally works in most cases for this kind of scenario. But this only works for individual combats and not for the overall force mixes, so you need to be a bit careful. For player force mixes, the rule for the attacker for the defender should be really between 1.5 to 1 and 2 to 1, which means an attacker needs at least a 50% to 100% advantage over the defender to be able to attack across the entire front line. The game scale does have a major effect. The game system also has a major effect. Let's now look at game system, or rules, briefly. Some rules are not optimised for a fluid and mobile game. The classic example is infantry movement rates in the old WRG micro armour rules. If it's not possible for infantry to move the expected distance to take an objective within the game terms allowed, it will obviously not work. You can ignore infantry and only use motorised forces, but that is really a fudge, and it's one that I would avoid. The next uh, example is game turn length. If the game turn represents five minutes of actual time, then those rules are not really optimised for a fluid game. Skirmish rules are the exception because the ground scale is so low and the nature of the game. I'll not be covering skirmish rules or scenarios in this video. So, if the rules cannot accommodate this kind of fluid mobility in an average game, it needs a very different victory condition system. Let's now look at scale, as this also has a major effect on scenarios. Skirmish rules are unique, and I'm not going to cover them here. The largest impact of scale is the distance an element can project firepower. In many ways, this is like a zone of control. In Western Europe, it was probably about 500 metres. In Russia, about 750 metres. In the desert, about 1,000 metres. The difference between these are all to do with terrain. If we use the Russian 750 metres, then a scale of 1 in 2,000 means an element can project fire out to about 37 centimetres in both directions. It can cover a frontage of about 60 centimetres, or 2 feet. If we move to a scale of 1 in 1,000, this expands to 4 feet, which is about as wide as a typical playing area is ever going to get. At this scale, it's hard to concentrate your forces at a single point, and forces generally don't retreat, as you would expect the next fire position in the rear would be 37 centimetres away and most likely off the playing area. You are not going to have a lot of movement at this scale if playing along the short axis. If playing along the long axis and using a scale of 1 in 2000, you could probably withdraw once, but then the width still means the element could cover the entire frontage. There are no flanks. At 1 in 4000, even if playing along the long axis, we need three units to cover the entire front line, and there are several retreat lines you could withdraw through. This is a reasonable scale for a game which involves a reasonable amount of movement. The game turn scale would typically be 30 minutes in this case, as infantry can move a distance equal to the fire range, which in this case is about 6 inches or 15 centimetres per game turn. I find 1 in 5,000 optimal for platoon scale rules, but 1 in 4,000 or even 1 in 3,000 may be suitable, especially if you have a large playing area. This playing area is rather small for platoon scale rules. If we divide our front line into three segments, as can be seen here, a player can concentrate on one sector to achieve the important 3 to 1 odds in order to advance. In this case, the attacker needs to have at least a 50% larger overall force mix than the defender. I generally find that along the long axis, the attacker needs to be double the defender's strength. And along the short axis, you could probably get a good game if the attacker is one and a half times the size of the defender. Obviously, a lot depends on the game system. Some game systems are very bloody, which means the elements are eliminated rather than retreat. In such a game system, this may not work as you end up with gaping holes and nothing to fill in it. I noticed that with LWRS, which me, you know, I noticed this with LWRS, which means you need to ensure a constant flow of reinforcements to get a game. In my similar scaled version of Core Commander, I used an idea from a set of Wargame Digest rules where elements are eliminated, but they come back in some cases. Thus, a hole can be created, but during the opposing player turn, some forces are returned, which can form a line, even if it's a weak line. 
If your game system uses retreats with some attrition, then the defender can still hold a line even if it's weaker as they retreat. When creating a scenario, this balance is critical. You need to ensure reinforcements arrive at a point which can, in most cases, allow the defender to continue to hold the line. This, to put it mildly, is not easy, and I've changed my position on this particular topic many times in terms of scenario generation. An older system I used provided for a randomly selected defender and attacker force mix. While I no longer use this system, it's useful as an example for this video. The attacker spins a d6 and that provides the force mix and reinforcements in terms of points. The same with the defender. If the force mix is 2 to 1 or greater on game turn 1, play is along the long axis, otherwise the short axis is used. In the old days, I used to have fixed force mixes for both sides, but that actually got a bit boring as the results were always very similar across a number of different rules, actually. It takes about three to six games before it becomes predictably boring, but it did occur constantly after a while. Still, I get some games out of this using a fixed force mix system. So eventually I end up knowing exactly what the result of a different force combination would probably look like and... Um, I didn't think this type of force mixed scenario generation system was really something that was going to give me the, the, uh, the legs that I needed. In most cases I use a 12 game turn game, giving the counter attack the same time as the initial attackers. I've changed this a bit and varied it um, to reduce the total length of the game or to give the counter attack less game turns. And sometimes I end up with games which only have nine game turns. It really depends how much time you have. It's preferable to have a reasonably flexible system because in some cases you need to have a shorter game. As in many cases, particularly for World War II, a short game is probably the only length of time you've got available in, let's say, a club. The only issue with this particular system is that some games I discovered became quite unbalanced. This line shows the worst defender, force mix for example. And when we look over to the attacker this shows the best attacker option. My games with this combination are very difficult for the defender and I suspect I may need to provide some handicap victory conditions when such a combination arises. But so far the combinations I've, I have played all have had their own unique nuance and this makes play interesting. Although I want to emphasise this chart arrangement system I've abandoned because even in this example there was a limited number of combinations and eventually I got to know what the results of most of them were. I can't pretend this is a perfect system for scenario design as there are so many moving, moving parts and rules dependency. But you can use something along these lines to create the initial scenario framework and then you can tweak it as required after some playtesting. Playtest is critical. I've learned more from my playtesting sessions than all my highfalutin theory or thought processes. The reason why this video exists is because a number of observations I've made while playing some noise for punk test games. The image you see here is one of these example games where I was trying a new tactic as the Germans, defending up front, which resulted in my opponent trying a new attack tactic. My opponent made a number of errors which caused unnecessary losses, but he really blew my right flank apart. On the other hand, my forward defence has given me more room to retreat, and there was a furious fight over the next objective, which was the central objective. As my opponent only achieved three VPs at the end, which was a draw, so I'm not sure which was the better strategy, uh, but it was an interesting game and something that I had not considered before. This uncertainty is what makes a scenario replayable. These days I use a card-based system to generate my ad hoc scenarios, which gives me significantly more combinations and combined with event cards has so far given me a unique game each time I play. Most importantly, because the cards are hidden, I never really know what reinforcements my opponents will get in a game. In the end, using this card-based ad hoc scenario generation system pretty much solved most of my issues. While most of my discussion in this video is related to World War II and Cold War conflicts, this system would work with Napoleonics as well. The main difference is the lower movement allowance and the lower reach of fire weapons. Rules and scale is critical, but ignoring these factors for now, how does this differ from World War II games? That is, how does Napoleonics games differ from World War II games? 
The reduced movement rates means mobility will be reduced. Both side forces need to start closer to each other, which is scenario defined. When in combat, breakthroughs will be less significant and possible advances and retreats slower. But as long as there is sufficient game turns, um, and if both forces start a great distance from each other, it does work in a similar manner. In fact, I found astounding similarities between my Napoleonic and World War II scenarios. However, the biggest differences I've noticed are to do with rules and scale, and it applies equally for World War II, Cold War, and Napoleonics. If playing a set of rules and a scale designed to reproduce a historical battle, there's going to be no issues with using this scenario framework system. However, most rules which players use are not designed for this. They are likely 1 in 1,000 scale, or 1 in 2,000, and as such, not optimal for this type of scenario and victory condition structure. When we move to ancient figure gaming, the system breaks down completely and a totally different system is required. When I get to ancients, I will look at this in more detail and I suspect any system which works with ancients may also work with smaller Napoleonic battles as well. That is, Napoleonic battles where you're not doing the entire battle, just a small part of the front line. And so this concludes episode 60 of my video series on game design theory. In this case, provide players with some useful guidelines on scenarios and victory conditions. Denken Sie daran, immer viel Heimatlinsel Kampfen.